lump in your ventromedial cortex. And if it's removed, we become perfectly good utilitarians. That matters because it means that your brain has a lump in it that has evolved to keep you from being a utilitarian. <laughs> and that means that evolution cares about your morals. That means our morals have evolved in part. That doesn't mean that that's the end of the story, it's at least part of the story. And that means we don't need God, and we know we don't, for our ethics. Okay? So we don't need a supernatural God to be the author of our morals. Okay, now I want to get to the most radical thing I want to talk about. And it has to do with Darwinian pre-adaptations that I mentioned before. So this, this requires a little bit of thinking, but then it's going to get really weird. Okay, the start of it's easy, then it gets incredibly odd. So I have to tell you what a Darwinian pre-adaptation is. I've already told you what an adaptation is. Okay? It's, it's uh, the function of the heart is to pump blood. <coughs> so Darwin had another idea. In fact, he had lots of ideas. And this one was... You know, a causal consequence of some part of an organism of no use in the current environment just might turn out to be useful in some funny environment and be selected. And he called that a pre-adaptation. He didn't mean it was designed, he just meant it happened to be around and turned out to be useful. So this is not an argument for intelligent design. Okay. And now they're called Darwinian pre-adaptations, except by Stephen Gould, who called them exaptations. So I'm going to give you three examples of Darwinian pre-adaptation. So I guess uh, you have the idea, right? It's a causal property of a part of an organism of no use in the current environment that turns out to be useful in some funny environment. So here's case one. Some fish have something called a swim bladder. It's a sac partially filled with air and partially filled with water. The level of water adjusts neutral buoyancy in the water column, which is pretty cool, okay? Good for the fish. Here's how paleontologists believe that the swim bladder arose. There are fish with lungs, called lungfish, and these fish got into some water without much oxygen in it. They swallowed the water. The water got into the lungs, which grows an outpouching off of the gut. The little bit of air got into the lungs and helped the fish survive. So now you had fish with water and air in their lungs. So these sacs, partially with air and partially with water in their lungs, were on their way to becoming swim bladders. And that's how swim bladders arose. Everybody got it? Okay, I'm going to give you one other example. You know that you have three bones in your middle ear that allow you to hear, the incus, uh, stapes, and malus, right? That transmit sound. They evolved by Darwinian pre-adaptations from three jaw bones in a teleost fish about 550 million years ago. First of all, these are both Darwinian pre-adaptations. Jaw bones have nothing to do with hearing, right? Second thing to notice is that relational properties matter. The three bones were near one another. Had one of the bones been in the spine, it wouldn't have happened. Okay? This is going to matter because relational properties all of a sudden matter. And this matters because it blows the heck out of the physicists, which is always fun. I'm, I'm partly in the physics department, and it's fun when they move. Okay. Now, question number one. With the swim bladder that adjusted neutral buoyancy in the water column, did a new function come to exist in the biosphere, adjusting neutral buoyancy in the water column? Everybody agree the answer is yes? Okay, good. That's, that's easy. Second, did it have causal consequences for the evolution of the biosphere? Well, sure. New fish, new snails, new proteins, right? So it's ontologically real, right? And now I'm going to ask my hard question. This is, you haven't heard before, I don't think. Do you think you could say ahead of time all possible Darwinian pre-adaptations of all organisms or just people? Do you think you could say all possible Darwinian pre-adaptations ahead of time? Could you list them? Does anybody think you could? Everybody except two people in seven years has agreed with me. And as I mentioned this morning, I had to kill both of them. <laughs> it's a moral act on my part. We all agree. You can't. 
you've just accepted something that's going to blow your mind when you follow out the consequences of what you've just accepted. Okay? So, please listen with me. It's going to change a lot of things that you thought. I think we can't. And I think part of the reason that we can't is we have no idea what all possible selective environments are. How would you list all possible selective environments? I have the faintest idea. Does anybody have the faintest idea how you do that? Okay, we don't, right? Now let me show you that the same thing happens in technological evolution. Um, I can tell it to you in two ways. The first is an apocryphal, but I, I want to believe true story. So it happens in Texas because Bush is from Texas. So there's a bunch of engineers trying to invent a tractor. And they have this huge engine block, because they're not dumb, they know they're going to need a huge engine block. And they put it on a chassis, breaks the chassis. Put it on a bigger chassis, breaks the bigger chassis. Keep putting it on bigger and bigger and bigger chassis, they keep breaking. Finally one of them says, and this is my pseudo Texas accent, it turns out it's actually a North Carolina accent, but I can't do a Texas accent. <laughs> you know, the engine block is so big and rigid. We can use the rigidity of the engine block itself and hang everything right off the engine block and use the engine block as the chassis. That's how tractors are made. It uses the rigidity of the engine block for a new function, being a chassis. Okay? Formula racing cars were made that way too. That's a Darwinian pre-adaptation. It's using an unused causal consequence of a part of a thing, in this case an engine block, for a new function being a chassis. You all see it? Do you think you could say ahead of time all of the novel uses to which you could put parts of things to do something? Uh-uh. I think you can't. Okay. Um, had an interesting discussion today out at York about that, and if there's some time I'll tell you about it. But I think the bottom line is, is we can't. That means that the evolution of our technology is partially by Darwinian pre-adaptations. That means it's not pre-statable. It's not pre-statable. This is radical. It's also true that lots of our inventions are used for purposes that are different than the purposes for which we invented them. For example, the computer was invented to compute the projectile velocities and trajectories of, of projectiles in World War II. Do you think anybody envisaged when, when, when Thomas Watson said they're going to need 17 computers, did anybody envision uh, the World Wide Web, uh, e-commerce, and YouTube? Of course not, right? These are totally novel uses of these inventions. Yet, I now want to define what I mean by the adjacent possible. Um, suppose you invented a channel changer, you know, a TV channel changer, uh, 400 years ago. Do you think you could make a fortune? <laughs> I love this because it's so simple. <laughs> there's no point in inventing a channel changer unless there's at least a couple channels, a bunch of, a bunch of TVs, and a lot of couch potatoes, of which I'm one. Okay. Right? I just want to tell you a story about this. At the Santa Fe Institute, I found a unifacial stone scraper by my house in Santa Fe, and I brought it in, and the, the anthropologist says, yeah, it's a unifacial stone scraper, Petronellis shirt, 300 years.